Fisker Magi Villa, Agus Caird Mila Falcha. Most people have heard of Robinson Crusoe, the titular character in Daniel Defoe's Tale of a Castaway, first published in 1719. It has been a long-held belief that the inspiration for the character of Crusoe was a Scottish castaway named Alexander Selkirk. Literary scholars and historians have since disputed this claim and are generally of the opinion that, in fact, Crusoe was an amalgamation of many such people. However, that does not diminish Alexander Selkirk's story. Welcome to episode 2 of Sons of Scotland. Not much is known about Alexander Selkirk's early life, but we do know he was born in Lower Largo in Fife on the east coast of Scotland in around 1676. He was the son of shoemaker and leather tanner John Selkirk, also recorded as Sel Craig, and Euphon Sel Craig Nee Mackey. It has been alleged that Alexander Selkirk was the seventh son of John and Euphon, and that his father John was also a seventh son, traditionally meaning that Alexander was destined for something great. This greatness, however, wasn't immediately apparent, as at school he was described as bright but unruly, although he was reasonably good at mathematics, which would stand him in good stead, and would help him rise from a mere deckhand to a navigator within the first six years of his maritime career. In August 1693, Selkirk's name appears in the Kirk records and was summoned before the Kirk session for his indecent conduct in church. By this time, he was already getting his feet wet and did not appear before the session as he was at sea. In 1701, he was again called in front of the session, this time for getting into a fight with his brothers over a practical joke played upon him. Alexander Selkirk, scandalous for contention and disagreeing with his brothers and being questioned concerning the tumult that was in his house, he confessed that, having taken a drink of salt water, his brother Andrew, laughing at him for it, he did beat twice with a staff. These outbursts of ill-temperedness would eventually find Selkirk stranded upon an island for over four years. A few years later, he joined privateer and explorer William Dampier to the South Pacific Ocean, carrying with them letters of mark from the Lord High Admiral, allowing them to attack and loot foreign enemies at sea. It was basically legalised piracy. At this time and location, it was mainly the Spanish and French that the English were concerned with, as the death of Charles II of Spain in 1700 had led to the War of the Spanish Succession, and Spain controlled most of South America. Selkirk was sailing master or navigator of Dampier's sister ship, Sank Ports, a 172 feet 16-gunned vessel. The original plan had been to take Dampier's two ships to the South Atlantic to attack Spanish galleons returning from Buenos Aires, but they instead sailed to the South Pacific via Cape Horn. Not long after arriving in the South Pacific, Dampier's ships fought a French vessel, the St. Joseph, which escaped and then informed its Spanish allies of their arrival. As a result, they were ambushed when attempting to raid Santa Maria, a gold mining town in Panama. However, they were successful in commandeering a ship and took supplies of wine, flour, brandy and sugar. An outbreak of scurvy killed the captain of Selkirk's ship, who was replaced by the 21-year-old Lieutenant Thomas Stradling. Once the two ships made it to Panama, Dampier and Stradling decided to separate. In September 1704, when stopping to resupply off the Chilean coast, Stradling and Selkirk came to loggerheads over the seaworthiness of Sank Ports. Selkirk wished to make repairs before sailing on. He declared he would rather stay on Massa Tierra, an uninhabited island in the Juan Fernandez archipelago, some 400 miles off the coast of Chile, than sail in such a dangerous ship. Stradling said, shite bag if you dinny, and Selkirk's fate was sealed. Well, almost. Selkirk regretted his decision and pleaded to be let back on board, but Stradling refused. He was handed a musket, a hatchet, a cooking pot, a Bible, some bedding and some clothes. His impetuousness, however, was perhaps his salvation as Sankport's 
foundered and sank soon after, ironically, and the surviving crew were taken prisoner by the Spanish. Selkirk initially stayed close to the coast of the island to keep an eye out for any sign of rescue. None was forthcoming. The coasts provided him with spiny lobsters to eat, but his neighbours, sea lions in heat, were noisy enough to make him move inland. Although his misery and loneliness were not mitigated, at least he had a more bountiful menu. Feral goats provided meat and milk, and wild turnips, cabbage tree leaves, and pink peppercorns added some variety. During the night, he would be attacked by rats, but after domesticating some feral cats, he was able to sleep soundly. The cats and goats would be his only companions, and he even allegedly taught some of the goats to dance, so he could dance with them. Just glad he wasn't from Aberdeen. He would keep a fire burning on a high point on the island, every day and every night, in the hope that a harbouring ship might come and investigate. Despite his minimal provisions, Selkirk was able to use materials at hand to make tools. A knife from barrel hoops he found on the beach. Two shelters from pepper trees, one for cooking and one for sleeping. Once he ran out of gunpowder for his musket, he would hunt goats on foot. This method did have its drawbacks, however, as on one occasion while chasing a goat, it ran off the edge of a cliff and he went tumbling after it. He lay at the bottom of the cliff for an entire day unable to move, but the goat seemed to have broken his fall. Not only did the goats provide sustenance and cushioning by the sounds of things, they also provided him with clothes. His father being a leather tanner, he knew how to work with animal skins. He didn't need to make new shoes, however, as his calloused feet were tough enough to go without. During his time on the island, two ships anchored off the coast, but unfortunately they were Spanish, so he had to keep well out of the way to avoid being caught. While hiding up a tree, one of the Spaniards came right up to it and peed on it. What a relief! For both, I suppose. For his leisure time, he would read his Bible and sing hymns. And then, finally, after four years and four months of isolation, Alexander Selkirk was rescued. On the 2nd of February 1709, the Duke and Duchess, two of William Dampier's ships, anchored and a landing party was sent ashore. Dr Quicksilver himself, Thomas Dover, led the party and described Selkirk as being almost incoherent with joy. As you would be, I think. The captain of the Duke Woods Rogers, later the first royal governor of the Bahamas, jokingly referred to Selkirk as the governor of Massa Tierra. Once again, the ship's crews were suffering from scurvy, and so Selkirk caught a few goats a day in order to restore them back to health. Captain Rogers, impressed with Selkirk's physical fortitude, as well as his peaceful state of mind, remarked, One may see that solitude and retirement from the world is not such an insufferable state of life as most men imagine, especially when people are fairly called or thrown into it unavoidably, as this man was. Returning to privateering with renewed aplomb, Selkirk was made second mate by Woods as they sailed the seven seas for Spanish galleons to ransack. They managed to capture a Manila galleon, only one of four ever captured. The successful crew eventually returned to England on the 1st of October 1711 to a hero's welcome. Selkirk had been away from home for eight years. His share of the plundered wealth came to around £800, which is about £120,000 in today's money. Not bad. You'd think that after his ordeal, he would have retired. No chance. In September 1713, he was back to his old tricks again and was charged for assaulting a shipwright in Bristol. Fleeing to Lower Largo, no one recognised him at first, having been away for so long and now being dressed in gentleman's clothes. There, he met a young dairymaid named Sophia Bruce, but despite eloping to London in early 1717, it appears the two did not get married. Selkirk then enlisted in the Royal Navy and married a widowed innkeeper, 
in Plymouth in 1720. Sadly, their marriage was short-lived, as Selkirk caught yellow fever while serving as master's mate on the 50-gunned HMS Weymouth, engaging in anti-piracy off the west coast of Africa. He died on the 13th of December 1721, aged around 45 years, and was buried at sea. Daniel Defoe's novel, The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe of York, differs quite significantly to the tale of Alexander Selkirk. First published in 1719, two years before Selkirk's death, it caused quite a stir in the London coffee houses of the time. The character of Crusoe was a nobleman, marooned on an island in the Caribbean for 34 years, and latterly he had companionship as well as marauders to fend off. But both Crusoe and Selkirk shared the common element of both being restless men, finding inner peace through the hardship of a life at sea and being marooned. Around this time last year I did the first of my hiking videos. I went up Largo Law, just a stone's throw away from where Alexander Selkirk was born and raised. I took the opportunity to visit Lower Largo and do some filming there. Well, after driving through Largo's narrow streets, I'm now down on the beach, as you can see, and Largo's famous son, probably the only famous son that I'm aware of anyway, is uh, Alexander Selkirk, who Robinson Crusoe uh, was based upon, or allegedly based upon anyway, uh, the castaway uh, in the uh, early 18th century, um, immortalised in the, the book Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Uh, so yeah, this is um, this is the, the beach at Lower Largo. Um, Largo Law is at Upper Largo. We've actually come down quite far, quite steeply to the beach. And yeah, let's go and have a wee look at the statue of Largo's probably only famous son. And there's a statue of Alexander Selkirk from 1885, uh, commemorating the original place of his birth. And here comes a car. <laughs> 